Welcome to this week's Money Metals Podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these treacherous times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the company voted 2015's Precious Metals Dealer of the Year in the U.S., Money Metals Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap Podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. Coming up, we'll hear a tremendous interview with none other than Jim Rickards, author of several best-selling books, including Currency Wars and The Death of Money. Jim talks about how China may be on the verge of collapse and the likelihood of chaos that would ensue in the global financial markets that could be similar but much worse to what happened back in August of 2015. Jim also breaks down several avenues that, in his studied view, all point to higher precious metals prices. Don't miss a must-hear conversation with Jim Rickards coming up after this week's market update. Another advance in gold and silver markets, another record for the stock market, another round of political drama in Washington, and another vow from the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates. Those are just some of the headlines being made this week. On Tuesday and Wednesday, Fed Chair Janet Yellen testified before Congress. She reiterated the central bank's commitment to, quote, further gradual increases in the federal funds rate. As I noted on previous occasions, waiting too long to remove accommodation would be unwise, potentially requiring the FOMC to eventually raise rates rapidly, which could risk disrupting financial markets and pushing the economy into recession. Incoming data suggests that labor market conditions continue to strengthen, and inflation is moving up to 2%, consistent with the committee's expectations. In spite of Yellen's hawkish tone, she didn't hit markets with much of anything new of substance on the policy front. Volatility remains fairly muted in equity and precious metals markets as they each make small advances. Gold prices are up at half a percent this week to trade at $1,240 an ounce as of this Friday morning recording. Silver, meanwhile, shows a 0.4% gain to bring spot prices to $18.09. Right now, metals markets seem to be moving more on an inflation trade than a fear trade. Optimism for the economy and equity markets remains sky high, with investors hoping President Donald Trump will be able to push through a pro-growth tax reform package later this year. Higher rates of economic growth could leave the Fed behind the curve when it comes to rate hikes. That could create an inflation problem of the sort Janet Yellen alluded to in her comments. Yellen Company could clash with the Trump administration on monetary policy down the road. But for now, everything is coming up roses. Trump's new Treasury Secretary is an ally of the Fed and the banking establishment. On Monday, the United States Senate confirmed Goldman Sachs banker Steven Mnuchin to head up the Treasury Department. The vote was largely along party lines. Democrats objected to Mnuchin based on his Wall Street ties and his roles in promoting the types of financial instruments that fueled the subprime mortgage bubble. Democrats loved to posture against Wall Street greed, but they rarely turned down Wall Street's campaign contributions. In the last election, investment banks and hedge funds lent their financial support overwhelmingly to Hillary Clinton. They virtually shunned Donald Trump. And on monetary issues, Mnuchin seems more in line with Democrats than Republicans in Congress. Mnuchin says he supports a so-called independent Federal Reserve, which is the rationale Senate Democrats used to defeat the audit the Fed bill last time around. A new audit the Fed bill is now pending in Congress. At some point, President Trump will have to weigh in on it. But as long as the Fed remains accommodative and the stock market stays elevated, there may not be much political incentive for him to fight for greater transparency in monetary policy. Perhaps he will find motivation in Andrew Jackson. Trump hung a portrait of Andrew Jackson in the Oval Office shortly after moving in. He views the nation's seventh president as one of his heroes. Trump's inauguration speech was even called Jacksonian by many commentators for its populist and nationalist overtones. Among the many things President Jackson was known for was fighting against powerful banking interests and dismantling the Central Bank of the United States. Jackson distrusted paper money and favored sound money, backed by gold and silver. He is also a champion of fiscal responsibility. He left office in 1835 with the national debt completely paid down. Jackson was the last president to ever pass on a national debt of zero. 
There's obviously no way that Donald Trump will be able to pay off the 20 trillion in national debt that he inherited from Barack Obama and predecessors. Not even Andrew Jackson himself could accomplish that feat. But a Jacksonian commitment by Trump to reforming the monetary system that made debt levels of $20 trillion possible could leave the country in a much better position when Trump leaves office than it is in today. In the meantime, investors shouldn't count on political solutions to save them from the risk created by the monetary system. Investors ought to take their own steps to protect themselves from the threats of Fed-fueled asset bubbles bursting, rising interest rates, rising inflation, and possibly even a full-blown currency crisis. Regardless of how high Washington raises the debt ceiling or how many dollars the Fed prints in the years ahead, physical precious metals will continue to represent a solid foundation of real value. Well, now for more on monetary policy, the possibility of currency and trade wars developing between the U.S. and China, and a top analyst's outlook for gold. Let's get right to this week's exclusive interview. It is my great privilege to be joined now by James Rickards. Mr. Rickards is editor of Strategic Intelligence, a monthly newsletter, and director of the James Rickards Project, an inquiry into the complex dynamics of geopolitics and global capital. He's also the author of several best-selling books, including The Death of Money, Currency Wars, The New Case for Gold, and now his latest book, The Road to Ruin. Jim is a portfolio manager, lawyer, and renowned economist, having been interviewed by CNBC, the BBC, Bloomberg, Fox News, and CNN, just to name a few. Jim, we really appreciate your time, and welcome back. It's great to have you on again. Great to be with you. Well, first off, Jim, you just published an article at the Daily Reckoning regarding China that I want to have you comment on. Uh, now, since the election of Donald Trump, who is advocating for import taxes on goods from China and elsewhere, most of the focus has been on trade and China's efforts to devalue their currency. A trade dispute with China could certainly have significant repercussions in the U.S., but you raise a host of considerations beyond tariffs and currency markets. Uh, talk for a minute about the internal politics of China, and then, if you would, share some of the macroeconomic shifts you see developing between the U.S., China, and Russia, because things seem to be heating up here. Sure. The thesis on China is, is really independent of the election of Donald Trump and Trump's policies. Now, I think that's a big deal. Obviously, Trump has some very uh, firm views on China, and he's got uh, staff and advisors who are going to pursue those. So I think there are a lot of very important things in play in the area of uh, currency manipulation, tariffs, trade, uh, subsidies to Chinese state-owned enterprises, etc. We'll talk a little bit about that. But there, there are bigger things going on in China that are true regardless of, of Trump's policies, even regardless of who's president. And uh, just to kind of cut to the chase, uh, China is going broke, and when you say that, people roll their eyes and go, what do you mean China's going broke? It's the second largest economy in the world, and it's got the largest reserve position in the history of the world, and it's got a big trade surplus. Uh, I mean, what, what are you talking about? Well, all those things are true. When I say they're going broke, I don't mean that, you know, China's going to disappear or the civilization's going to collapse. What I mean is that they are running out of hard currency. They are going to get to the point where they don't have any money, or at least money that the world wants. And let me explain, uh, Mike, exactly what I mean by that. Going back to the end of 2014, China had a reserve position of about $4 trillion. That was the largest reserve position in the history of the world. Now, just for the listener's benefit, what, you know, what is a reserve position? It, it's actually very easy to understand. Imagine you make uh, $50,000 a year, and uh, your taxes and your expenses and your rent and all the things you've got to pay come to $40,000 a year, and you have $10,000 left over, you put that in your savings account, or you can put it in, your, in the stock market, whatever you want with it. But that's a simple example where you make 50000 you spend and pay taxes up to 40000 you've got 10000 left over. That's your surplus. That goes in your savings account. That's your reserve. It's no different for a country. A country exports things and gets paid in hard currency, and then they import things, and they have to pay hard currency to get it, and they invest overseas, and people invest in them. So you have all these capital flows and trade flows going back and forth. But if at the end of the day you have more hard currency coming in than going out, that's your savings, and your national savings account, if you want to think of it that way, is your reserves. That's what we mean by reserves. And China had basically a $4 trillion reserve at the end of 2014. Today, that number is about $2.9 In other words, they have lost 
$1.1 trillion in their reserve position in a little over two years, not quite two years. So the, the reserves are going out the door. Now, well, people say, well, you've got you know $2.9 trillion left. Isn't that a lot of money? Well, it is a lot of money, except of the $2.9 trillion, about $1 trillion of that is not liquid, meaning it, it, it's wealth. It's wealth of some kind. It, it represents investment. But China wanted to improve their uh, returns, actually, on their investments. So they invested in hedge funds. They invested in private equity funds. They invest, made direct investments in you know gold mines in Zambia and so forth. So about a trillion of that is it's wealth, but it's not liquid. It's not money that you can use to pay your bills. So now we're down to 1.9 trillion liquid. Well, about another trillion is going to have to be held as what's called a precautionary reserve to bail out the Chinese banking system. When you look at the Chinese banking system, private estimates are that the bad debts are 25% of total assets. Well, that's, you know, banks usually run with 5 maybe 7 8% capital, even if you said 10% capital. Well, if 25% of your assets are bad, that completely wipes out your capital. So the Chinese banking system is, is technically insolvent, even though they, they don't admit that. I mean, they cook the books. They take these bad loans. Let's say I have, I'm a bank and I have a loan to a um, state-owned enterprise, a, a steel mill or something, and the guy can't pay me, can't even come close to paying me, and the, and the loans do. I say, well, look, you owe me you know, $300 million. Tell you what, I'll give you a new loan for $400 million, but I'll take the money and pay myself back the old loan plus the interest, and then I'll give the new loan a two, a two year maturity, and I'll see you in two years. So if you did that in the U.S. banking system, you'd go to jail. You're not allowed to do that. You throwing good money after bad. You're supposed to write off the loan that is clearly non performing or where the borrower is unable to pay. But in this case, it's just extend the pretend, and so it's still on the books. In my example a $400 million good loan with a, with a two-year maturity. But in fact, it, it's a rotten loan that the guy couldn't pay in the first place, and now he just can't pay a bigger amount. He's probably going to go bankrupt and not to write it off at the end of the day. So with that as a uh, background for the Chinese banking system, people kind of shrug and say, well, can't China just bail it out? they got all this money. Well, the answer is they could, and they've done so before, and they can bail it out. But it's going to cost a trillion dollars. So you've got to put a trillion dollars to one side for when the time comes to bail out the banking system. Well, now you're down to $900 billion, right? Remember, we started with $4 trillion. $1.1 trillion is out the door. $1 trillion is illiquid. $1 trillion, you've got to hold to one side to bail out the banking system. Well, now you only have $900 billion of liquid assets to defend your currency, to prop up the Chinese yuan. But the problem is the reserves are going out the door at a rate of, you know, it varies month to month, but $30, $40, $50 billion a month, some months more, some months over $100 billion. So if you just say, well, I got $900 billion in the kitty, it's going out the door at you know, 50 to $100 billion a month, I'm going to be broke by the end of 2017. So that's what I mean by going broke. And you say, well, wait a second, where did the $1.1 trillion, you know, the first part we talked about that, that the reserve position went down, where did the money go? It didn't disappear. Well, no, it didn't disappear. What's happening is that everybody in China is getting their money out. They're scared to death that the yuan is going to devalue. So what are the Chinese doing? You know, by hook or by crook, some of it's legitimate, some of it's corrupt, some of it involves bribery, some of it involves false invoicing. Uh, you know, the, by, by, as I say, by hook or by crook, that money is, uh, you, know, you know, I travel around the world quite a bit, and you go to Sydney, Australia, Melbourne, Vancouver, Canada, London, Istanbul, Paris, New York. The story's the same everywhere. The Chinese are buying up all the high-end real estate. The Chinese are buying up condos. Well, they sure are. And that's part of this capital flight. That's part of this money getting out of China. We've seen it before in Argentina in 2000, Mexico in 1994. It's happened over and over again, and it always ends in, in complete disaster. So this is what's confronting China. Wow, that sounds like a very bleak picture indeed. Uh, so what can China do about this, Jim? If your investors or your citizens perceive that the exchange rate is going to break and you're trying to maintain the exchange rate, the way you do it, you use your reserves to buy your own currency. So if, if money's going out the door and my currency is trying to get weaker and I'm trying to hold it up at a certain level, I'm trying to peg it to a certain level, how do I actually do that? Well, the way I do it, if I'm China and I'm trying to prop up the yuan, I take dollars and I buy yuan. So some businessman says, I want to get my yuan out of the country, and I'm the central bank, and I say, okay, give me your yuan, here are the dollars, and you send the dollars out of the country. But I buy it at a fixed rate, and that's how I maintain the peg. So in other words, 
you have to use up your reserves to maintain the peg if you have an open capital account and this peg the peg is always going to be under stress because of these interest rate and currency differentials so that's what china's doing it cannot work they will go broke you always fail now having said that china is not actually going to go broke they understand what i just described for the listeners they see this coming so they're saying to themselves well, what can i do what can china do to keep it from happening well they can close the capital account and they're starting to do that in a small way the problem is it's kind of all or none you can completely close the capital account and use firing squads for anyone who tries to get the money out of the country but now you've kind of taken yourself out of the international monetary system they can't do that they they just got into the international monetary system the chinese yuan was just included in this, the imf special drawing right that's this world money that the imf prints so having gone to great lengths to be to join the club they can't now quit the club and close the capital account so they're working around the edges but it, it, it will not be successful and always fails they could raise interest rates and give up the independent monetary policy and say well, we're going to raise interest rates to ten percent well, that could work because, you know, hey, you put the interest rates that high, people will say, well, I'll leave my money here. You know, I'm not worried about the devaluation anymore because I'm getting so much interest that I'll keep my money here. The problem with that is, going back to what I said earlier about the bad loans, their companies are already going bankrupt. What's going to happen if you raise interest rates? They'll go bankrupt faster, and then that's going to cause unemployment. That's going to destabilize the people in the Communist Party of China. So they can't do that. So what's the third thing? If you can't close the capital account, at least not completely, and if you can't raise interest rates without sinking the economy, what can you do? You can devalue the yuan. So that's what they're going to do. So that makes that a very easy forecast. Now, I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow morning, but you'll you look at how George Soros broke the Bank of England in 1992. This is how he did it. He just said, I can sell sterling longer than you can buy dollars. And he did, and eventually the Bank of England uh, devalued the currency. And that's what China's going to have to do. But now, come over to our friend Donald Trump, President of the United States, what is his biggest complaint? He says that China is a currency manipulator. They keep their currency too weak. Well, from 2000 to 2014, approximately, that was a valid complaint. They were keeping their currency too weak. But it's not true anymore. As I described, China is using their hard currency reserves to prop the yuan up, actually make it stronger. So it's not true that they're weakening the yuan today. They're actually propping it up. And as I said, they're going broke in the process. But what's going to happen if they devalue to save the capital account, to save the reserves, what's that going to do? That's going to inflame Trump, and he's going to come down on them with, uh, you know, hammer and tongs and tariffs, and we're going to have a trade war with China. By the way, this has happened time and time again, where it, something starts out as a currency war, and it turns into a trade war. That's what happened in the 1930s, and I can kind of see that happening again. So we're, we're looking at a train wreck, but in terms of what to expect, on August 10, 2015, China devalued... 3% in two days, not not 10%, not 20%, 3%. The U.S. stock market crashed immediately from August 10th to August 31st, 2015. The U.S. stock market went down over 10%. Think about where you were at the end of the summer in 2015, you know, on vacation or taking the kids back to school or whatever. Uh, but people thought they were staring into the abyss. Now, the Fed came out. They didn't hike rates in September 15, as expected. Uh, that was the famous liftoff, which got postponed, and there was a lot of happy talk. And, yeah, the market turned around. I know it's at an all-time high, but for those three weeks, you saw the market completely crash. Well, what do you think is going to happen if China devalues 5% or 10%? It's going to be even worse. So there are just some big, big stresses in the system, and uh, I'm watching them all, all very closely. Interesting times. Yeah, it certainly is. And China's uh, absolutely stuck between a rock and a hard place, as you just described there. Uh, now, let's specifically talk about gold for a minute. Now, we can see two roads higher for metals prices from here. The first would be a return of significant price inflation and weakness in the U.S. dollar. The second route to higher prices would would be the return of safe haven buying driven by serious geopolitical turmoil. China, obviously, would be at the forefront of that and perhaps a shock to the global financial system. Uh, what do you see as the, as the way forward for metals currently, and, and what do you think could possibly derail this move higher in metals that we've been seeing here in recent weeks? Well, I think both of those things are in play, and they're kind of opposites, but that's okay. You know, keep the, keep the opposites in mind. But whether it's monetary ease and an inflationary takeoff, that'll clearly send gold higher. But even if the opposite happens, the economy slows down and the stock market crashes because of, you know, something like the Chinese devaluation that we just talked about, 
gold will catch the safe haven bid, and that will send it higher. But there's a third factor I would I would put into the mix, which is just good old fashioned supply and demand. You know, I travel around the world quite a bit, and when I go to Switzerland, I don't I don't spend a lot of time with the banks. I spend most of my time with refiners and vault operators and secure logistics providers, the people who actually handle the physical gold. I recently returned from China. I was in uh, Shanghai and Nanjing, and I met privately, kind of one on one, with the two. Uh, two of the uh, five biggest gold dealers in China, uh, the heads of precious metal trading for two of the big banks, and they said to me, you know, don't believe what you read. Uh, demand for gold in China is as strong as ever. People can't get enough. My going back to what I said earlier about people getting their money out of China, well, well, that's fine if you can, if you're connected enough, or you're an oligarch, or a princeling, or or a business person, or whatever, and you you can find a way to do it. But what if you can't? What if you're, you know, uh, maybe an upper middle class Chinese? You got some money, a couple hundred thousand dollars, maybe a million, but you know, you're not a, you're not an oligarch. You're not a survivor of, a, you know, the son of a survivor of the long march with Mao Zedong. What do you do? You know, you're not buying a million dollar condo in Vancouver. You're just trying to preserve your hundred thousand dollars that you've saved up uh, for working hard all these years. Well, those people are buying gold. They don't trust the stock market. They've seen the volatility. They don't trust the real estate market. They know it's a bubble. Some of them, you know, have might have a condo in China, but there's a limit on that. But they are buying gold. We see it in the uh, figures from the Shanghai Gold Exchange. By the way, that was a very that was one very interesting thing I learned when I was in China, because we had had some estimates. I formed some, and others did as well about how much gold is going into China or is available for investment by the Chinese using uh, mining output. There's pretty good numbers from geological surveys. Uh, Hong Kong exports to China. Those numbers are reliable. Swiss exports, those numbers are reliable. So we don't have a complete picture, but we had a pretty good idea. And then we also had the Shanghai Gold Exchange physical sales because that's somewhat transparent. So putting all that together... We were seeing somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 tons a year going into China. But what I did not know what, until recently was how much of that was private demand and how much of that was government demand. That was how much was going directly to, to the government reserve position, how much was being bought by consumers in, in China. And what they told me, and these, these are the dealers, these are the people who actually you know, deal on the Shanghai Gold Exchange and, and handle the metals, they said it's 100% private. They said the government buys a lot of gold, but they operate completely off the books, completely through stealth channels. So I found that amazing because what it told me was that there was even more gold in China than I thought. I know the Chinese government's buying gold. I know the people are buying gold. But if 100% of Shanghai is just going to consumers, that's a huge number. And the government's getting whatever they're getting through other channels. Now, that makes it harder to estimate. But I know enough from you know Russia and Iran and Turkey and other sources that China is in fact getting uh, quite a bit of output. They're probably getting it directly from the the mines. In other words, the the Chinese import figures go through the Shanghai Gold Exchange and feed uh, consumer demand, and the Chinese government controls the mining industry and probably takes all of that. That's 450 tons a year, and then some. So there's a lot more gold in China. Now, what it, what it means, however, is I'm not. I'm not a geologist, I'm not an expert on what they call peak gold, but I talk to enough mining interests and I know that mining output is flatlining at best, perhaps declining, and grade ores are, are getting worse. And it's, 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 there's less gold for every ton of uh, ore that you mine. New discoveries are not piling up, they're not opening mines because of costs, etc., and the fact that the price of gold has been down somewhat. So putting all that together, you see voracious demand, flat or declining supply, physical gold shortages popping up here and there. All it's going to take is one publicized failure to deliver by a, a, a major bank or an exchange or somewhere along the line to start a, a buying panic. Talk about what you're expecting in terms of Fed policy here in the early part of Trump's presidency, Jim. Markets seem to be uh, taking a bit of a wait-and-see posture here when it comes to monetary policy. How do you uh, see gold responding based on that? Gold's got a little bit of a head, headwind right here in the short run because I expect the Fed to raise interest rates in March. If they don't, they'll almost certainly raise them in June. So uh, I think March, but whether it's March or June, you're looking at a rate hike. Uh, you're looking at the market discounting further rate hikes. This is what Janet Yellen said in her recent testimony uh, before the Congress. And so that's going to make the dollar stronger. 
which is a little bit of a headwind for gold. But just looking past that a little bit, we have an extraordinary situation where there are three vacancies on the Federal Reserve Board right now, two completely empty seats, and one, Dan Terrell, who just, igno- just announced his resignation. He announced it, but I think it will be effective sometime in April. So count that as the third seat. And then we have two others. One, Janet Yellen, her term expires next January, so the president's going to have to announce that replacement by December. And then beyond that, uh, Stan Fisher in the middle of next year. So you're looking at three seats immediately, four appointees by the end of the year, including a new chairman, and then one just six months behind that. So there are only seven seats on the Board of Governors, the Fed. So Trump is going to fill five of them, at a minimum, fill five of them in the next uh, 16 months. And there's one Republican already on the board, Jay Powell. You don't hear much about Jay Powell. That's because he's outnumbered by the Democrats. Well, that's about to change. He's going to find uh, a lot of his uh, buddies sitting next to him. So so Yellen, uh, saying her days are numbered as chairman is an understatement. She's going to be outvoted, outgunned, outmanned uh, almost immediately once the president makes these announcements. Now, so, so Trump basically owns the Federal Reserve Board because of this appointment position uh, situation. Uh, so Trump's going to get whatever he wants. The question is, what does he want? Well, he kind of told us. He and Steve Mnuchin, the new Secretary of the Treasury, said they want a weaker dollar. Well, okay, if you want a weaker dollar, then don't be raising rates. Don't be uh, pursuing a tight money policy. And so if Trump follows through on the logic of the cheaper dollar, he's going to appoint dubs to the board the market's going to get the signal immediately, and the price of gold is going to soar because easy money, you know, weak dollar means higher dollar price for gold. So we've got some very short-run headwinds, uh, maybe between now and April, but for the, certainly the second half, even the last three quarters of the year, I am extremely bullish on gold. We should probably also touch on developments in Europe. The Brexit vote last year uh, may have signaled the beginning of the end of the European Union. There are some key elections coming up, and, and nationalists and populists are pulling well across Europe If the anti-globalist candidates win elections in places like France or Germany, the EU will be in serious trouble. Uh, Would you care to speculate on the outcome of some of these important elections and then what's behind this movement, Jim? Well, I don't really speculate. I use a lot of science. You know, I was one of the ones uh, beginning last March, that is March 2016, and continuing right up until uh, a couple days before Brexit to say that the U.K. would vote to leave the European Union. Uh, you should short sterling and buy gold, and that's exactly how it played out. So so we got that one right now. What's interesting is that, um, you know, I was on record, I have, I have all the tapes and TV interviews and so forth, saying that the U.K. would vote to leave the EU, that, that was, they would vote for Brexit, and also that Donald Trump would win the election, which I got laughed at when I said it, but, uh, but that turned out right. So 99% of the pundits and the market indicators and so forth were on the wrong side of both of those. They said that the U.K. would remain and that Hillary Clinton would win the election. Now, having said that, a lot of people are feeling burned. They're like, oh, man, I got two big calls wrong. I don't want to do that again. So they're, they're now calling for these nationalist parties to win these elections in Europe and lead to the breakup of the European Union, the European Monetary Zone, the decline of the euro, etc. I'm now on the other side. Having correctly predicted Brexit and Trump, I'm going to say that these mainstream parties, Angela Merkel uh, in the center, parties in France and the Netherlands, are going to, to remain in power, that the EU will stick together, that the euro will get stronger. So I'm extremely bullish on the European outlook. Now, there's going to be some volatility. Uh, some of these minority parties are going to do better. Marine Le Pen will get more votes than she did the last time. The Freedom Party in the Netherlands, Geert Wilders, will get more votes than he did the last time. He might even get more than everybody else, but not enough to form a government because no one else will play in his sandbox. So I think you will see nationalists rising, but not enough to take over. And at the end of the day, the center governments will remain in power and the European Union will remain intact and go back to what I said before about Trump wanting a weaker dollar. Well, currencies are easy. They're cross rates. If one goes down, the other goes up. So if you're going to have a weaker dollar, that means you're going to have a stronger euro. So I'm very bullish on Europe and the euro. 
Yeah, interesting uh, outlook there, and uh, we'll see how it plays out. Your very studied view uh, is worth a lot. So uh, we certainly appreciate your time, Jim. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, We want to urge people to check out uh, the new book, The Road to Ruin, and go to the James Rickards Project website and and take a look at how you can follow Jim on a more regular basis. We greatly appreciate you uh, guiding and educating folks on the actions they can take with their investment lives, and uh, hope you have a great weekend and we look forward to having you back on again before long. Thank you, Jim. Great. Thank you. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to Jim Rickards, author of Currency Wars, The Death of Money, The New Case for Gold, and now The Road to Ruin, and also editor of the Jim Rickards Strategic Intelligence Newsletter. Check back next Friday for our next weekly Market Wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening, and have a great President's Day weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes. For answers to all of your questions, or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds, call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.